Hi, welcome to the Fit and Healthy Today show. And today our topic matter is glaucoma. Glaucoma is one of the leading causes of blindness in the United States, affecting between two and four million Americans. Um, it's caused by, well, we've got a lot of root causes, but basically what happens is the eye has abilities to maintain fluid uh, moisture level consistencies and what happens is the eye fluid doesn't drain properly or replace properly and it builds up putting pressure on the optic nerve the lens tissue and the remainder of the eye generally increasing the eye pressure and this substantial increase in eye pressure damages the nerves retina lens and in turn can cause blindness so very, very important as we discuss through here some of the nutritional aspects um, for prevention. But right now I'm going to go into the couple of kinds that we experience. Um, they estimate between 60 and 80 percent of seniors over the age of 80 will have chronic open angle. 89 percent of the glaucoma is caused over a period of time. It's not a sudden occurrence. And it shows up with the peripheral vision narrowing, headaches, um, kind of vague visual disturbances, and or you get a little bit of tunnel vision. So everything just kind of t tends to close in, a little bit of blurriness occurs. Now closed angle, which is about 10% of the time, it's fast changes. It happens real quick. Um, the fluid pressure increases quickly and literally can cause blindness very fast. You'll get intense pain, generally in just one eye. The eyelids will swell, you get watery eyes, and then in turn, vision loss. There is a rare, uh, in less than 1% um, in glaucoma, that involves no pressure or non-detectable eye pressure changes. A good ophthalmologist can detect eye pressure changes, and once eye pressure reaches over a certain point, then you have what's called diagnostically glaucoma. Now, when we look into the root causes, they're multifaceted, but I have to say number one has got to be nutritional deficiencies. There's a lot of research that supports that the collagen, which is, makes our veins and arteries and capillaries uh, very pliable and flexible, with time due to vitamin C deficiencies. And remember the National Institute of Health has been pointing out that more and more evidence of scurvy among our population because of the poor quality of, of uh, foods and the lack of vitamin C in the foods is causing this uh, borderline type of scurvy. Well, these nutritional deficiencies then cause a hardening of the vascular system and things can't um, uh, dilate or constrict properly so we will not end up with proper drainage from the eye. Stress, which causes the body and causes vasoconstriction and causes the body to become very acidic, a contributing factor. Accumulation of we uh, waste, metals, calcium, especially if you're doing calcium carbonate, uh, Tums, uh, products like that that give you a lot of calcium carbonate. And I have more doctors recommend OSCAL and calcium carbonate sources for calcium and I want to scream because they're usually recommending it number one without magnesium which is a vasorelaxer and helps the blood vessels open. And number two, these calciums that poorly absorb in calcium carbonates build up on the vascular system and the eye tissues are very delicate small little tiny capillaries so it can easily build up with these calcium deposits. Um, high blood pressure in and of itself overall the body can raise off also ocular pressure. Illnesses such as diabetes, macular degeneration, remember blood sugars or insulin Ah, causes damage to the vascular system and so once again contributing to the hardening of the arteries. Somewhat preve pre uh, preventable if we keep the vitamin C with bioflavonoids up, good fats and certain oxy antioxidants that we'll talk about later on. Prescription drugs such as, and you wouldn't think of this as causing, antidepressants again, uh, blood pressure medications and corticosteroids. Remember, corticosteroids damage all connective tissues. So if you're sitting there getting that shot of cortisone in your shoulder and your knees all the time, or you're taking your allergy medications and you're inhaling it deeply here through the eyes, guess what? This, this is not very far from here. 
That, just as though it damages the middle membranes in your nasal passages, it goes in your bloodstream and does something very similar to your eyes. So alternatives are always a good idea when you're talking about allergies, except in emergency cases. Um, as far as some basic prevention things that I see happening and that a lot of um, ophthalmologists and optometrists see happening is people are watching television or doing their computers in the dark. So they got this one bright light in front of them, darkness all around them, and that really causes some real ocular problems and uh, improper focus and utilization of light. So when you're watching TV, don't do it in the dark. Movie theater, obviously an exception to the rule. Avoid long-term usage on the computer, and later on in the show we'll go through kind of an exercise that can help ex uh, keep your eyes and circulation flowing in, in the eye area. Avoid tobacco, obviously cigarettes particularly cause the uh, collagen matrix to disintegrate, therefore causes hardening of the arteries. When you exercise three times a week, three to four times a week or more, I like the more better, you get this increase and decrease when the body's pumping the blood and all, and your vascular system gets exercised as well as your heart and the rest of the body and the muscle tissues. So. Exercise to increase circulation is very, very important and decrease oxygenation into these little small capillaries in the eyes. Overuse of sunglasses. I know most people say you got to protect from the UVA, UVB, oh my gosh, you got to watch the cataracts and all. But remember, a majority of the problem with cataracts, in my opinion, is due to nutritional deficiencies. It's not due to the sun that we've had for millions of years. Uh -uh. We've had it, and we've only had sunglasses for what, since they've been able to, to you know, work on uh, glass, maybe for a couple hundred, few hundred years. That's how long we've had sunglasses. It's not because we have excessive sun. It's because we're nutritionally deficient. Now, if you're always keeping yourself in the dark all the time, and yet your eyes are trying to focus, that's not a natural process. So. If you tend to have eye sensitivities, obviously when it's real glary outside or whatever, that's one thing. But when the sun's out, I don't think the sunglasses should always be going on. It's like, um, for example, um, these recent uh, down, down in South America when the miners got trapped. And you know how they came out and they were going like this to the light because it was so incredibly bright, except for the ones obviously that were coming out at nighttime. Um, the body gets used to that darkness, and when you no longer are exposing it to light, it gets very light sensitive. So I never wear sunglasses, very, very, very rarely. Um, you know, if I've had an eye infection where you know it was real sensitive, that type of thing, or if my pupils get dilated by my ophthalmologist, yes. But on a regular basis, I wouldn't do it. I know they um, there's mixed uh, reviews on that one, but overusing them not a good idea. Plus also, you know, when you have the sunlight, it stimulates pituitary action and therefore helps um, de with depression and mood elevation. So watch wearing those sunglasses all the time. Now, when we talk about diet, and diet's a contributing factor to the small little capillaries disintegrating and the increase in eye pressure. You want to eat as many organic alkali producing vegetables and fruits. And I say organic because remember back on the cause things, I talked about the chemicals. See, these chemicals cause oxidation, rust on your vascular system, especially on the small delicate capillaries. And so if you're sitting there eating tons of chemicals, guess what? They're going to settle in your eyes, your nerves, everywhere else in your body, your fatty tissues but they'll cause damage. So when you're focusing on the vegetables, focus on a variety of colors. We're gonna do oranges and yellows and greens and reds, blueberries and cherries. All the full spectrum of the rainbow is what you should be eating in your foods because you see color better that way. In addition, they alkali the blood and they have antioxidant properties on the eyes. Fish or um, essential fatty acids, and I should have probably included um, nuts in here, those good fats in the diet um, from fish, walnuts, almonds, pecans, avocados, they're anti-inflammatory and they uh, decrease certain inflammatory responses in the body. They also keep the blood flowing better. So when we've got better blood flowing, decrease of inflammation, um, as a matter of fact, for example, dry eye syndrome, people who develop dry eye, 
There's some studies that support, and we have a local um, optometrist, uh, Dr. Thompson and Dr. Goodman, who are recommending using um, uh, 500 milligrams of DHA fish oils for dry, dry eye syndrome. But these fats, in addition, not only help with dry eye, but reduction of inflammation in the eye and the rest, eyes and the rest of the body. Avoid caffeine. Remember, caffeine is vasoconstrictor. So caffeine or caffeinated beverages, and we're not just talking coffee, we're talking about that 48 ounce soda that you're drinking is a vasoconstrictor. Eliminate food allergies. Anytime you have a, a food allergy reaction or aller allergic reaction, you get inflamed. So try to avoid the foods that you know you're allergic to. I know occasionally we all love certain things that we ate as a kid that we're now sensitive to, understandable, but on a regular basis, if you know you're allergic to something, please avoid it. Alcohol, sugar, sugars on the blood. You know how I mentioned how diabetics, one of the first things that goes in a diabetic besides male function in a man is your eyes. Those small little capillaries in the eyes are very badly damaged by high amounts of sugar and alcohol, any of those types of uh, things that raise the blood sugars. Please keep them to a limit. And whenever you do eat sugar, always accompany it with a fat and some source of protein to slow the sugar response down in the body. Now, supplements for glaucoma, and these do work. My, my father has glaucoma. And years back when uh, he was following my instructions, his eye pressure dropped one third when he was doing his supplements properly um, because genetically we have a propensity for high, um, higher and that hereditary does make, heredity does make a difference, we have a higher propensity towards having glaucoma. And since I know that, oh man, there isn't anything on this list um, that I don't do other than ginkgo to thin the blood because I already have thin blood. Magnesium citrate relaxes the blood vessel walls and increases blood flow. Now that works on high blood pressure and it works on eye pressure. It's a vasorelaxer. Aster C with bioflavonoids. Studies show it significantly reduces eye pressure over a period of time. Now it takes time to reverse the collagen damage and the oxidation that's done to those small capillaries. But with time, and you could use this as prevention, that will help the vascular system be able to function better in the eyes. The fish oils we already talked about. A good multiple vitamin, high in Bs, since most of the food doesn't have anything in it. <laughs> a good multiple vitamin to get basic minerals and antioxidants is really important because remember I talked about oxidation in the vascular system in the capillaries? Those help with the oxidation. Grapeseed extract, this should also say pine bark extract. Uh, so grapeseed or pine bark extract in combination with bilberry. The studies supported in combination with the eye drops that the doctor will give you for glaucoma on a consistent basis, it'll lower eye pressure 40%, four, zero. The medication only lowered it in the 20s, but you add grapeseed extract or pycnogenol in combination with bilberry, and you'll watch that eye pressure drop 40%, hopefully keeping it within normal range then. Uh, good studies that came out in 2010 on that one. Ginkgo biloba increases uh, blood flow, slightly thins the blood, and reduces inflammatory response in the vascular system. Chromium, especially for diabetics, can keep the sugars more stable, but also been shown to support eye health. Now, I don't have zinc on here as another mineral, because I'm hoping that you're doing a good multiple vitamin high in Bs. Zinc, selenium, and all your other minerals except for calcium carbonate from limestone, which you find in Tums and those poor calcium supplements, all help with your vision. Arginine citrulline, this is a fairly new study that came out about a year ago. There's some evidence that maybe some of glaucoma might be caused by a nitric oxide deficiency. And nitric oxide is what causes um, uh, vasodilation. You know, magnesium relaxes the blood vessels um, arginine citrulline, which are naturally found in the body from foods, you know, we utilize foods to make arginine citrulline, is what increases nitric oxide, which is for vasodilation. If you have poor male function or diabetes or high blood pressure, the arginine citrulline can vasodilate and reduce eye pressure as well. Forskolin, 
I know we use that a lot in the natural industry to lower blood pressure, but there's clinical studies that also show it lowers eye pressure. It's a plant, coleus for scolin, a pretty leafed plant, and it can also too. The only thing with it is you have to be mindful if you're taking a blood pressure medication, you have to have your doctor monitor while you're taking both. Um, I think this kind of says it in a nutshell. If you've got glaucoma, I truly do believe, as I mentioned before, that we can get it pretty much gone between your doctor and property supplementing and diet changes. We can keep, keep you from having it make you go blind. Next, we're going to be moving on to the fitness portion of our so where I'll be re reviewing an exercise for eye circulation. Thank you. Hi, welcome to the fitness portion of our show. And today I'm going to show you an exercise that can help increase circulation to your eye and actually work on exercising your eye as eyes as far as focus is concerned. Um, this is a very basic exercise and it actually is from yoga. What you basically do, not to explain all the nuances of it, but you're basically going to rub your hands together and you're trying to build warmth and in yoga there's an energy that comes about this rubbing of hands together. What you're going to do is you're going to rub your hands together for about 20 to 30 seconds. You can tell it's starting to get warm. Put it up to your eyes and close your eyes and cover your eyes. Breathe in and then breathe out and you're going to open your eyes to where you're looking through your fingertips and see what happens as I'm looking through my fingertips I've still got closeness and I'm looking through but yet I'm looking at distance at the same time so it really makes my eye camera have to work and if you do this particularly if you're sitting at the computer and you stand up and you do this little exercise it can help the focus of your eyes in order to maintain that circulation and prevent some of those computer eyes and then hopefully lessen the chances of the glaucoma. Thank you very much. Next we'll be moving on to the research portion of our show. Hi, welcome to the research portion of our show, and with us today is Ralph Turciano. Thank you very much for that intro. Now to start with, let's wonder what these four things may have in common. An O. Henry Barr, a Mr. Good Barr, a Babe Ruth, and well, we shall now call them Man Mellows. Well, remember this title called LabelGMOs.org, and that's GMOs with an S.org for initiative to get on the California ballot. You'll want to remember it after I tell you what this first story is, or I should say last story when I'm done. All right, now, in 10 minutes, we'll go through things that could possibly cure or reverse type 1 diabetes to cancer. So I want to go through this kind of fast. All right, this is what was discovered recently, and this was printed in the Proceedings of National Academy of Sciences. What they discovered is a chemical produced by the pancreas itself actually has the ability, at least in animals to start, to literally reverse type 1 diabetes. In a words, cure it. They discovered this. And this research was funded by the Canadian Institute and actually this research was discovered at the Banting and Best Diabetes Center for the Director of Division of Endocrinology and Metabolism at the University of Toronto, where 90 years ago insulin was discovered. Well, they found out the simple amino acid compound called GABA, basically corrected type 1 diabetes. Now, to, what they did is they injected it, but to read through their study the way they had it, it goes like this. The significance of GABA is that it corrects both known causes of type 1 diabetes. Remember, this is first in animals. It works in the pancreas to regenerate insulin-producing beta cells, and it acts on the immune system to stop the destruction of those cells. Those two actions are necessary to reverse the disease and prevent its reoccurrence. Until now, there has been no effective treatment for type 1 diabetes outside of insulin injections. GABA, this is the weird part about it, GABA has been known for decades to be a key neurotransmitter in the brain, a chemical that nerve cells use to communicate with each other, but its role in the pancreas until now was unknown. But it turned out 
They identified the described, well, they identified the found out that GABA is important in regulating the survival and function of pancreatic beta cells themselves. They said, and quote, GABA is the first agent to act both by protecting the insulin producing cells from damage and by decreasing the body's immune reaction against these cells. Something incredibly interesting as far as type 1 diabetes, which was to now thought as a totally incurable disease and only treated by insulin. Something I really, really hope some extra money goes into researching. Until then, a GABA looks like a strong potential for those looking to reverse type 1 diabetes. Now it comes to learning. Now, I don't want to knock mobile phones so much because it became so dependent on this electronic technology, but they discovered this. For the first time, they provided proof that extremely high-powered EMFs, kind of like those produced by cell phones, indeed influencing, influence the learning process on a synaptic level within the brain, independent of other factors besides stress. So. With increasing power, they discovered that EMS are able to elicit local warming of body tissues, being described as the thermal effect. Yes, you are microwaving yourself, in short. Reportedly, mobile phones can cause local warming of the brain, less than about a tenth of a degree centigrade, but enough to change the function and the structure of the brain, which is unexplained until now, it may influence cellular activity. And this was done by the Department of Neuroanatomy and Molecular Brain Research outside the University of Whipperpool. Although there was daily training and effortless contact and exposure to the environment, increased levels of stress hormones were also produced through EMFs. Now, they don't believe enough it's to be caused by the cell phone to actually hamper learning at this point. But they believe with a combination of EMFs from your computers to your TVs and everything else like that, this electronic technology, ironically, even though it's advancing society, may slow down our capacity to learn by literally beginning to gradually microwave our brains. Something to think about for the future. All right, now we come back to something your mother always told, always told you about posture. And this is really interesting. They found out that how well you hold yourself plays a huge, huge role in tons of biochemical functions in the body, including Good posture results in higher testosterone levels. So you guys which are athletic out there looking to build some extra muscle, stop slouching. All right, they said that not only does the posture, uh, make poor posture make a bad impression, but it actually makes you physically weaker. They did a study produced in the Journal of Experimental Social Psychology. It was called, It Hurts When I Do This or You Do That. What they said, and I'll quote it, is while most people will crawl up into a ball, for example, when they're in pain, Bones and Witherman's research, which are the researchers, suggest that one should do the opposite. In fact, the research suggests that curling up into a ball, for example, when you hurt yourself, may make the experience more painful because it'll make you feel like you have no control over your circumstances, which may in turn intensify your anticipation of pain. So when you're slouching over things like this, it's basically setting your body up for some sort of biochemical reaction, which is not going to be friendly. It says these behaviors can help create a sense of power and control when you basically move your posture up to basically standing up straighter. And that may turn in to make the procedure or pain more tolerable. Adopting, they said, a powerful expansive posture rather than constricting your body may also lead to elevated testosterone levels which is associated with increased pain tolerance and decreased cortisol, which may make these experiences less stressful. And of course, with more testosterone, builds your strength over time. So sit up straight. It has a lot more to do than basically just how comfortable you are. All right, now something as far as we discovered in regards to cancer. A very, very inexpensive compound, actually derived from what's called the long pepper, which basically comes from either southern India or southeast Asia, they found out killed cancer cells. But let's use their words. They discovered that cancer, even though as chaotic as it may appear, actually does have an order to it. And they discovered this. What this substance called Piper Longjamine, I may be mispronouncing that, otherwise short as PL, generally did one thing prevented the cancer cells from using antioxidant enzymes to repair themselves. The reason that's important, 
Cancer cells have an extremely high metabolism and therefore produce tons of what's called reactive oxygen species. Without cancer cells' ability to use any antioxidant enzymes, they literally self-destruct or they kill themselves. They found out that this pepper surpassed the chemotherapy drug used to treat breast cancer by far, and they called that Taxol. This is printed in the online in Nature July 13th issue. This plant-based compound, Piper Longgemine PL, derived from the fruit of a pepper, plant found in South, southern India and Southeast Asia, appears to kill cancer cells by jamming the machinery that dissipates high oxidative stress and resulting in high levels of reactive oxygen species, which destroy the cancer cells. The, to their surprise, the pepper induced cancer cell death independent of the tumor suppressor gene's activity. And when they tested the pepper in normal cells, it had no impact on normal functioning cells, totally non-toxic to normal cells which are inside your body, but extremely toxic to cancer cells because it disallowed them from using any defenses against the own free radicals that they produce themselves. Something to really look at, and it's called Piper Longgemine. The problems with it, of course, very inexpensive, very cheap, very effective, totally non-toxic, can't be patented. So look for it, push for it, get some research, because otherwise there's absolutely zero financial incentive to basically get this to market. And they're not going to do it just to be a nice guy and save your life. All right, now it comes down to dieting. One thing they found out which really interesting had to deal with soluble fiber. They found out for every 10 grams of soluble fiber that you took, it reduced your body, your, your visceral fat, your stomach fat, down by 3.7%. When you combine that with exercise, it reduced your body fat down by 7.2, not body fat, stomach fat, down by 7.2%. Now that usually averaged over about a five year period of time. If you took 40 grams of fiber, you took looking close to 14% reduction in stomach fat. Now think about it. People usually gain body fat. By just doing 40 grams of fiber, which is normally recommended, you'd be losing body fat where everyone around you is basically adding it on. Now, back to the first part. Man Mellows, Mr. Goodbar, O. Henry Bars, and basically, you know, Babe Ruth. Well, this is what they said. They found a new substitute for gelatin. They found that they can get gelatin from human-derived cells. What they're doing now is they're taking human gelatin genes and inserting into yeast. And it may be making it to a market because they're going to replace all the gelatin that's used in marshmallows, candy bars, and anything else that's used in gelatin with human gelatin genes. And the researchers are still testing the human yeast gelatin to see how well it compares to other gelatins. So next thing you may think about is you may have human gelatin in your snack foods. Labelgmos.org. Go to it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much for joining us. Do your research and watch us again. Thank you.